Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us in our second sessions of Asia Derma Waterfall Continuous Education. My name is Juri from Index Holding Singapore, your host for this evening. Allow me to introduce our moderator for tonight, Professor Gochilio, who is our scientific committee chairman of Asia Derma. Professor Go will share with us some house rules on raising questions during the uh, sessions. And I will now hand over to Professor Go to introduce our speakers and program for tonight. Professor Go, please. Hmm. Oh, the slide is not moving. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, so we have an opportunity for question and answers too. And if you look at the icon, there's a small Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, some of them will have it on top of the screen. Uh, you can ask questions anytime throughout the lectures. In other words, while the lecturers are giving the lecture, you can open up the box and then type in the questions and we will filter through the questions and I will direct them to the respective speakers that uh, you want to answer. So get the question coming on. And we can answer questions in between lectures. If you have some very pressing uh, question to ask, uh, you're most welcome to submit the question as well and then we'll try to get you answer. If not, we'll answer it towards the end of the, of the uh, two lectures and we'll have enough time for a Q&A as well. And I hope all of you will find this lecture, uh, use, uh, this webinar very useful and I'm sure that you will enjoy all the, uh, uh, the information provided by the speakers. So I'll call upon uh, Dr. Jerry Tan now to give his first lecture on the management of uh, acne vulgaris and update on it. Jerry, please. Thank you so much, Professor Goh. It's a pleasure to be here. It is um, actually early in the morning in Canada, so it's, uh, I know it's evening there. And I'm going to go to share screen and So this is a um, talk on and a very practical update on what's happened in acne and acne research over the past years that hopefully can be applicable to your practice. So I hope to be able to provide you with some uh, points that you can use in a practical fashion. I'm from uh, Western Ontario, the Windsor campus, which is actually near Detroit, and it's, um, uh, it's in the same province as uh, Toronto. It's a pleasure to be here. My conflict declarations are listed here for you. I have uh, worked with industry as well as with uh, pharma companies in uh, drug development, as well as with some of the aesthetic companies in their products as well. My agenda is going to be very straightforward. Let's look at um, what evidence there is on management. Uh, let's also not forget about proper evaluation, very specifically not neglecting the trunk. Then I'm going to turn towards the topicals. How can we maximize and get the best uh, efficacy from our topical use in a practical way? And what are we going to do with the issue about systemic antibiotics when we're trying to mitigate the use of these products uh, in the future? Oral isotretinone, how to and not to, and what's new and maybe not so new. And then the final part is going to be a little bit of information on what's happening with the medicalization of treating acne scars and what's happened over the past five years. So acne evidence-based guidelines, there are lots of very good ones. Um, for clear um, stakeholder interest, of course, I highlight the Canadian ones. But on the other hand, there are also excellent European ones that were developed in 2016. They will be probably updating that relatively soon. Um, and the American ones had theirs um, published in about 2017, 2018. So there are lots of very good evidence-based guidelines. I'm of course aware of the excellent Singaporean acne guidelines as well, um, which have lots of very well-rated levels of efficacy and very clear recommendations that have uh, come from that as well. So all of these guidelines basically segregate treatment of acne and acne uh, severity into four major silos, comedonal, mild papillopustular, moderate, and then severe. And if you notice, all of these guidelines really focus on the face. And 
this is from the Global Acne Alliance, which is a fairly, it's a nice way to look at it because it tries to take a lot of information and compile it both pictorially and in a, uh, a simple practical fashion in terms of what treatments are available for the different levels of severity, mild, moderate, severe. And if it's primarily comedonal, they have specific recommendations. If there are more papules and pustules, um, the treatment options are modified somewhat and so on and so forth across the moderate and severe group. Now, the intent with this type of initiation and induction of therapy is to try to achieve clear, almost clear. And if they do achieve that, then the recommendation for maintenance therapy is topical retinoids or the uh, retinoid BPO combination. So that was straightforward, right? It's pretty easy. You look at the face, you grade the severity, and you choose treatment. But there's a bit of a problem because when you look at this patient, how severe is her acne? You'll probably think, okay, if I'm in clinic, she has some inflammatory lesions, primarily at her chin, not a lot. Maybe she's mild, at most, um, mild, moderate, until you look at her back. And the reason I wanted to show you this, it's, it's really critical that we don't neglect the back. A lot of patients are not that keen on showing you their back if it looks like this. And it's really important to inquire. It's just part of our natural assessment. Um, when you come to see us, we want to make sure we check every area that acne might involve. And this patient did not want to show me her back. She said, can we just talk about my face? And so the initial inclination by my staff was maybe she doesn't have acne on her back. So I think for some patients, they won't show you because they're so embarrassed. So we just make it as part of our natural routine, as just part of our examination, so that we can get a comprehensive sense of how severe your acne is. And that will drive your therapy much more than her face, okay? Now, let's start with topicals. Now, the way I like to think about topicals is topicals are the workhorse of acne treatments. The thing about topicals is they are truly misunderstood. So we have to start with appropriate selection so we understand why we're choosing certain products. Then we have to play defense across the field, not man on man. We're trying to play the zone. <clears throat> zone defense is really important to explain to young people because if they play sports, they'll get it because they play hockey, they play soccer um, or, or football in, um, in Singapore. Um, but that notion of making sure that that whole area is treated is really critical. Access, is the product even available? Anticipated timelines, you have to tell them when you expect to see improvement, when you expect to see irritation, and how can we reduce adverse events, and how can we maximize adherence? So let's take a look at appropriate selection. We have a wide range of topicals, including combinations or permutations of very many of these, from Dapsone, BPO, retinoids, alzolaic acid, and antibiotics. And of course, on the other side, we have all of the presumptive mechanisms of action that we're trying to influence. And what you can see is each of these products can have assorted different effects on the pathogenesis and the pathways of acne. What we didn't have in the past was a SIBO-suppressive product, but recently, clascoterone has been released and has undergone its phase three with uh, good success. So this will be uh, marketed, I think, fairly soon in a number of different jurisdictions. And it's the only topical that also has a SIBO suppressive role. So now we might be able to actually impact all of those four quadrants, anti-inflammatory effects, anti-C acne effects, reducing uh, follicular and fundibular keratolytic uh, hyperkeratosis, as well as reducing sebum. So, it's the first time I think we'd be able to address all of those aspects. Access, is it available? And is it, if it's available, that's great, but then is it affordable? And if it's not, that will lead to primary uh, non-adherence because the patients can't get it and, or they can't afford it. The second is we talked about field application, uh, cover the field, not the spots. Look at the appropriate amount of product. And typically, I think if you use sunscreens, you'll notice if you put a pea-sized amount of sunscreen in your palm and work it in, 
it will be a nice thin layer on two palms worth. Now, on your face, you probably have at least four palms worth on your face. So you need, in, in uh, estimation, about two pea size amounts. When are you going to put your active product on? You, I would recommend you put it on before you use moisturizers, before you use foundation, before you use sunscreen. <clears throat> timelines, it's important for timelines because we don't often talk about this, but if you let patients know when you expect certain things, they'll understand how along the pathway you're going to be doing checkpoints. And the first one to two weeks, we recommend and we initiate uh, the notion that you might have problems with irritation and dryness within that first two weeks. So that's where we need to have the mitigation aspects in place. At two to four weeks, you should start seeing some improvement, but you know the improvement you see might be more um, in a minute form that's st statistically significant if we were to count in month numbers, but it might not be clinically relevant yet. But the longer you use it, 12 weeks, of course, we talked about as the duration of uh, most RCTs, randomized controlled trials and acne. But quite frankly, if you double that duration out to about six months, 24 weeks, that's when you see most of the time the maximum efficacy of your therapies, not just oral isotretinoin, which we have in our mind about that six month, four to six month course of therapy. It also applies to topicals. Adverse event reduction, you know, with topical use. Um, at the end of it, what you don't want to have is the patient who having skin like sandpaper, rough, irritated, and unhappy with you um, and unhappy with their skin. So how do you reduce the risk of irritation and how do you risk, reduce the risk of dryness? So a few years ago, we undertook a study comparing three different arms to standard overnight application. So we looked at every other night, mandated moisturizer, and three hours per night. We looked at how that would affect the issues of redness, stinging burning, dryness, and scaling. And what we found was that the lowest scores of intolerability, and what I'm showing you here is within the first one to two weeks, you see that peak of intolerability. And this was a combination uh, adapting BPO product. And that peak of intolerability with every night use is very characteristic of topical retinoids on the face. What we found that by using every other night application and mandated moisturizers, we could subdue and reduce the height of that peak so that it wasn't as, um, as uh, intense. And by doing that for the first four weeks and then moving patients who were tolerating it after that to every night therapy, at the end of 12 weeks, we lost no efficacy. And that's really important to do as well because you don't lose anything by going in a little gentler at the beginning. We also found that with uh, reminders, and this was uh, done by a group from uh, the US, that an internet-based survey using basically telephone uh, email reminders had this effect on adherence. Firstly, it had a huge effect on primary adherence. That is, they actually went and filled their prescription in and opened up their tube. If they didn't have that reminder, it was about half of them even went to get their prescription or opened up their tube. And if you kept giving them weekly reminders, you could see that the curve maintained itself extremely well, whereas it progressively decayed even more to a greater extent without reminders. So I think at some point we're going to digitize the reminder aspect in terms of sending, sending weekly emails and it might go to the trash, but if they have to at least move it to trash, they'll be reminded that they're moving something about their acne to trash. So that was my six A's on using topicals. I wanted to switch a little bit because there's been a lot of focus on how to use antibiotics in a more appropriate fashion in dermatology, and in this paper specifically in the acne. This is one of the schematized pathways to inflammation that I have adapted from multiple sources. Um, but the way I want you to take a look at this is that it doesn't require C. acne, Scutibacterium acne, to be the major player to lead to inflammation. It can simply go through increased lipid quantity and a change in lipid quality 
modified by changes in these uh, intracellular uh, control mechanisms to lead to inflammasome activation that can directly lead to inflammatory lesions and also to comedones. Okay. So we don't really have to have C acnes as part of it. And that's actually really helpful to understand because that was one of the findings many years ago when patients with acne, in some of them, didn't have a lot of C acnes. So why do we think this is happening? It may be being driven by the hormonal triggers, insulin, IGF-1, and androgens because of high glycemic foods and dairy. So really some interesting work that's been done in uh, native populations in Papua New Guinea, as well as in uh, the Aceh Indians in the uh, South American area, plus the uh, group who have Laron syndrome, who don't really make much in the way of IGF-1 and have no acne until you give them IGF-1 recombinant type. And then their young children going through puberty, um, their women can develop PCOS and they can develop acne and they goes away if you ease back on the, uh, the recombinant IGF-1. And of course, then the impact on poor sleep, we know exam stress can trigger acne as well. So what are the non-antibiotic options? I always start with lifestyle. And we don't do a lot of lifestyle in dermatology, but I really think this is the time that's ripe for it because we've had so much time to think and to try to understand how important lifestyle is to our mental health and the rest of our bodies. So I start with low glycemic index diet simply because in the lifestyle aspect, that has the best evidence. It has three randomized controlled trials, all showing positive outcomes in acne. <clears throat> Plus, quite frankly, you know how low glycemic index diet was developed? It was developed for diabetes patients to reduce the risk of diabetic complications. So reducing the risk of obesity, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, all of those things that we aim for, for good health. And if good health and reduction in acne go hand to hand in hand, I see no reason why we can't uh, propagate and, and expound and recommend that to our patients. Dairy avoidance, this is primarily based on retrospective information, and, um, but it has enough touch points plus enough uh, in vivo information, in vitro information to suggest that there is um, relevance there, particularly in the protein fraction of dairy products, so whey protein uh, in exercise supplements, stress management, appropriate sleep. In females, the use of spironolactone has been used for decades without high quality evidence, but it's still used because we know it works. And at this point, I know that there are now three randomized control trials that will be undertaken for spironolactone to evaluate efficacy. And of course, birth control pills that are extremely helpful for women as well. For both genders, we have oral isotretinone and it's being used widely and um, hopefully as safely as possible. And I'll give you some little tips about that. Antihistamines and then devices. Now, I just wanted to pull up a really interesting study for you. This is a desloratadine study done um, a few years ago now comparing desloratadine with ISO to ISO alone. Now, it's a really gutsy trial because isotretinoin alone is a really good drug. <clears throat> and we all know that because it works so well. And this group of patients with moderate inflammatory acne treated for 12 weeks. What they found was adding desloratadine doubled the response rate to acne clearance. And the thinking is that this desloratadine adds anti-inflammatory efficacy to the uh, isotretinone uh, so that the combination makes it work more effectively. And I think one of the major features that we now know about isotretinone is some of the things that we've been doing may need to be rethought a little bit. So let me go through what um, has developed over the past few years. <clears throat> of the different possible dosing regimens for isotretinone, this is one of the only randomized controlled trials. And the randomized control trial here was in patients with moderate inflammatory acne. They were treated for a total of 24 weeks. And importantly, they were followed up for one year to evaluate for recurrence. And what they looked at was a mid-dose, 0.5 to 0.7 milligram per kilogram per day. It's probably lower 
than the previous standard conventional dose of one milligram per kilogram per day. And then they looked at an even lower dose than that, which is the 0.25 to 0.4. And then they compared it to the 0.5 to 0.7, but only one week per month. Okay, so that was their randomization trio. And this mid box is what I'm going to point out as what I suggest as index efficacy, because this is closer to the standard dosing that maybe a lot of us were taught. And interestingly, I'm going to compare it back and forth with this box now, which is the lower dose versus the more conventional dose. This was considered index efficacy, and the efficacy at 0.25 to 0.4 was the same in terms of achieving clear, almost clear. Um, as far as patient satisfaction goes, the highest patient satisfaction was with the lower daily dose. And the one-year relapse was not particularly different. And if you do a chi-square analysis on this, this is, this is not a significant p-value difference. So my suggestion then is moving out of this is there isn't particularly any value to using the slightly higher dose except that patients get more side effects. And you know that from the perspective of dryness and colitis, as well as potential for hair loss. And importantly, that initial flare of acne, if you start at a slightly higher dose, 0.5 to 1, if you start it lower, we rarely ever see it. The second issue that came up with this cumulative dosing concept, <clears throat> that concept was developed <clears throat> during the era when they couldn't use oral isotretinoin for much longer than four to five months. And their dosing thoughts initially were, maybe it should only be 0.2 versus uh, one milligram per kilogram versus uh, two milligrams per kilogram. It was that high uh, per day. So very quickly it was obvious that the two milligram per kilogram per day was not tolerated well by patients and that particular um, arm stopped. And then it was the 0.2 to the um, versus the, the uh, one milligram per kilogram, but only used for four to five months. And it was based on that, that they found that they couldn't use it longer than um, five months. So at one milligram per kilogram, uh, 30 days times five, it's, that's how you get that outer limit of 150 milligram per kilogram. And if it's for four months, it's 120. Now we looked at evidence suggesting that that made sense for remission. And the important part that we found was there were only two low-grade studies that explicitly looked at the cumulative dose. And the doses seemed to vary to induce remission, uh, and it varied based on severity. And we know that because now the more recent studies um, indicate that sometimes much higher doses are needed for patients with more severe acne, and much lower doses are needed to induce remission for, for those who have lesser severities of acne. So we could not support the concept of threshold cumulative dose based on the analysis that we did based on that study. So what's not new but not well known, number one is initiate at low doses and then start moving up and you don't have to push hard. You can always, you can always be, be um, faulted for being too rough with your patients. You can never be faulted for being too gentle. Who's ever said to you, oh, you're too gentle? You know, if Devin and I are treating patients or we're doing fillers or Botox, to hear a patient say you're so gentle is a wonderful thing. But we should translate that same type of gentility to ways we treat patients with potentially harsh drugs, but we know now how to drive them more safely and more gently. And I treat until no new acne agents for one to two months, not until their threshold. Okay, And I ignore the cumulative threshold I use. Okay, acne scarring. Uh, a few years ago, we did a study looking at the genesis of acne scars over a course of six months in patients who had acne. Very difficult study because you had moving targets. You had the presence of acne, primary acne lesions that were coming and going. And then you also had scars that at that time, we didn't know whether they were coming and going, but we do now. So what we found was the vast majority of these scars developing at within the six months uh, observation period came from macular erythema or macular pigmentation. And of those, the vast majority of them came from papules. So what it suggested to us was this pathway. Skin that was normal, 
an increase in innate immunity leading to subclinical inflammation. And this is work that's already been done years ago in Leeds with increased IL-1. And then increased adaptive uh, immune mechanisms leading to clinical inflammation. And then as the inflammation subsides and then these papules and pustules and nodules deflate, they lead to this macular pigmentation, macular erythema. Sometimes people call it post-inflammatory. By the way, post-inflammatory is probably a misnomer because if you biopsy at particular stages, you'll actually still see inflammation. So I prefer the word macular erythema, macular pigmentation. And then from here, it diverges into two potential pathways, one to normalization. And we can only say that because in this study, we found that one third of those scars that we found within that six month period were gone at the end of that six months. So there was a one third chance that they would have matrix um, repair more than matrix degradation leading to normalization. If it was flipped and there was more matrix degradation and less repair, then these patients would have more problems with the atrophic persistent scarring. So the question for us as clinicians and as research scientists is, how can we push this atrophic group more into the normal group? So um, in terms of how to look at reducing the risk of acne scars over time, of course, if you have no acne, you have no scars. And the hope is in the future, we don't just think about treating acne. <clears throat> we think about preventing it in our kids so that it's one less issue that they have to go through. But with atrophic acne scars, we know how high a burden that is on patients who have it. So if they're starting to develop acne, how can we mitigate it early? What we know is if we treat early, we probably should be able to mitigate it early. And why do we know that? Well, it's by the first presumption, which is the longer you leave acne, um, and here is a study that we did years ago that demonstrated that the longer the patient has acne, the more there are visible scars forming, so that by, one, um, by two to three years, you have a large proportion of patients who have visibly um, prevalent to acne scarring. And this study done for prevention of acne scarring, treating moderate to severe acne, um, using oral isotretinoin showed that patients who had, who were treated with isotretinoin, who had less um, duration of acne, had fewer acne scars in terms of their scar score compared to those who had a longer duration. So treating them early should be able to mitigate the amount of scars that develop, which is intuitive, um, but at least they've now gone to show it. So the question now is, is there a role for topicals and many years ago, there was a role for topicals, but this group never picked up on it any further. This was a study done about a, almost 12 years ago now. So what they found was P-acnes could induce collagenase, matrix metalloprotease, um, and it also inhibited TIMP, the tissue inhibitor of matrix metalloprotease. When the culture system was treated beforehand with tretinoin, it flipped it so that now p could not induce matrix metalloprotease. And there was actually an escalation in tissue inhibitor of matrix metalloprotease. So tretinoin, this retinoid, topically could shift from a matrix degradation to a matrix repair phenotype. That idea came into an in vivo study more recently. 10 years after, remember that was a 2008 study. This one is a 2018 study that looked in vivo on the effect of this retinoid on patients who only had atrophic acne scarring. No acne, their acne had come, it had gone, it had left scars. Um, and they had moderate to severe facial atrophic acne. They were treated with adapting um, initially just once daily for the first four weeks and then pushed a little harder twice daily for the subsequent 20 weeks. And what was found was that there was, in terms of global visible improvement, very significant levels of improvement in about 80% of these patients. And if you were to do biopsies, which this group did, they saw an increased signal of procollagen and collagen. So that's the genesis of what um, it was found in 2008, the idea that we could uh, move into a matrix 
repair phenotype. And this group now shows that the matrix repair phenotype is also dependent on, on collagen formation. So it drives fibroblasts, the factories that make all the good things uh, in terms of scar repair, uh, collagen, elastic tissue, glycosaminoglycans, the factories now can be turned on by this. Uh, we did a subsequent study to look at the effect of adapting 0.3 and DPO 2.5 in patients with acne and acne scarring. So this is now not just acne scarring, but it's two moving targets. It's the presence of acne, can the treatment help with acne, and what does it do to the acne scarring? And does it do anything to the acne scarring beyond what it does just to the acne? Okay, so it was a split phase study, and what we found in terms of acne overall global success, that is the achievement of clear, almost clear, by 12 weeks, which is where most clinical trials and randomized trials for FDA approval are censured, they stop at 12 weeks, you see that there's a uh, almost threefold greater level of success of active versus vehicle. But that's not the important point of this graph. What's really interesting is if you stop at 12 weeks, you're just on the uptick of that slope. Keep it going. Look at what happens at 16 weeks. Look at what happens at 20 weeks. What happens at 24 weeks? So this is the type of duration that we typically use more like in oral isotretinoin, right? But at that point, you have, at six months, you have twice the potential for global success than at 12 weeks. So it encourages us to think that um, if you work with these medications longer, and you don't fold up tent and go home too early, that they will still progressively help patients. This was one of the most heartening results I've seen for a while, uh, because what we were looking at here was not acne, but it was acne scarring. That was the other aspect of the study. So on the vehicle side, what we saw was a progressive escalation in number of scars forming over time, which you would expect because their acne is active, and those acne lesions are leaving scars behind. What you saw on the active side was not a, an equilibration of scars where there was no greater number of scars at all. You actually saw a reduction in number of scars. Now that actually is more in keeping with what the, um, the Baltimore study showed, which is a reduction in uh, visible scars. So at this point, the idea then, when patients present to us with scars, multiple different modalities, and Adam is going to touch on that uh, in his talk. But what I wanted to show you is that the, a scar algorithm and the way to think about how we're going to manage patients with scars, depending on the different scar types, probably should have topical retinoids inserted very early on, really to try to help improve and shift that group that is um, developing scars to more of a matrix repair group and also to turn the fibroblast machinery on so that as you move down your pathways to procedural treatments that they will be able to then get you to the level of improvement you want more quickly. So I wanted to summarize, we've looked at some of the evidence on management and there are lots of excellent um, evidence-based guidelines available on acne. I have uh, provided a few of that to you. The Canadian ones, by the way, are, are online open. I'm not sure if the Singaporean ones are, but if so, they're, that's excellent as well. Um, the American ones are certainly available on their website. Um, evaluation, the important part there is don't neglect the trunk. And I think sometimes when patients come in and they want to focus on the face, they might want to focus on the face either because it's really important to them or because they have it on the body, but they're even more ashamed of their body. And everyone sees their face, then they can deal with, you know, they can, they need a little extra help with that, but they just don't want to show you the back because they're so ashamed of it. The third part is maximizing topicals. I've told you about what I think about regarding the six A's. And then avoiding systemic antibiotics. There are new treatments developing, and I've touched on a few of these. Isotretinoin, um, not so much what's new, but what should be known more widely. 
And then finally, what we've learned about acne scarring from the medical aspect to try to help the repair aspect as we move on to not just help acne patients with their active acne, but also how to help improve their scars at the end of it all. Thank you very much. All right, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. There, there, there are some questions here, but I think we will leave it to the end. But there's one question that was asked was, in this era of COVID-19, uh, is there any need for any modifications in the treatment of acne, in particular in the use of oral isotretinoin or topical isotretinoin? Um, Yes, in this era, I think there are a lot of patients who have a lot of time to spend and are distracted now because they are sequestered. So because of that, I actually see a lot more patients with uh, focusing on their acne and actually excoriating their acne. So I think it's clearly an area of uh, increased stress for them. Um, as far as oral isotretinone, everything we can do live, we can do video-wise. Um, laboratories we can send out remotely to their uh, laboratories uh, testing areas and their pharmacies we can fax out um, prescriptions to them. So actually I find that in this era managing isotretinone patients is actually very very straightforward and they actually really love it because it's so much more efficient and convenient for them. They get on the video, we take a look. If they want me to check their chest and back, most videos are good enough to see that. They're not, video resolution is not great for lesions, but I think for extent of acne, it's not, it's not so bad. Um, as far as topical retinoids, I don't really see a problem with that either. If they wanna give me more resolution photographs, they are saying, look, there's some little white bumps here. Can you see that on video? And I say, not really, but why don't you send me a good uh, photo and we can evaluate that more at that point. So I think acne and rosacea are two conditions that we tend to be able to evaluate actually very effectively in a virtual way. Okay, and then and there's another question is that, is there any role of topical retinoids on established scars that has already developed can you reverse that with topical retinoids in any way? The, the only scars I think that will respond to topical retinoids that are established in that way are probably really the smaller scars, the, um, the smaller saucer scars. I'm, when I was evaluating my patients, none of the ice picks really responded, nor did the large box car scars. But I think the small saucer ones do tend to respond. Okay, so we'll stop here for a while and continue with the next lecture, which is very important because we all, all of us who have treated patients with acne scars will experience the frustration of patients that are not very satisfied despite multiple treatment and all sorts of combinations that are given to them, to them. But nevertheless, we can still help them look a bit better uh, with the treatment. And, with, to, and we have uh, today Devin Lin from Brisbane who will be here to share his experience on the management of the frustrating acne scar. Devin, thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me, Prof. Uh, let's go to the share screen. Uh, let's go to this, let's share. Uh, and let's play. All good there. So the, the title of my talk is The Art and the Science of Acne Scar Revision. Um, we know the incidence of acne scarring varies between 11 to 30%. Um, the impact cannot be underestimated. It causes thought, judgment, emotion, causes depression, and in extreme cases, even suicide. So much of this talk, much like what uh, Jerry Tan presented, is a uh, review, evidence-based review uh, over the last six years. 
but there are limitations. There's lots of limitations in the context of um, trials and papers because there's no universal grading scale. There's limited description of the scar types and there are different scar patterns within the individuals. So there's no uniform way to measure improvement. Also, dermatologists realize there's variable skin biology between the races and multiple modalities uh, are used in many of these uh, reports. So why do we treat it? Because it changes lives. Because effective treatments are possible, it's important to educate patients and it's our duty. So much like what um, Jerry has said, I, I uh, echo, because a lot of his studies have actually shown that um, prevention, effective control of acne using medical therapy is the number one way to prevent acne scars. And, and this a diagram is from his paper. So this is how I look at the management of acne scars and how it's progressed over the years uh, with 1982 with the FDA approval of isoprednoin, subcision in 95, TCA cross by the um, Koreans in 2002, uh, Rox Anderson with uh, fractional lasers, Picos, and in the past few years, the use of dermal fillers uh, as well as new subcision techniques. So once again, effective control of acne, medical therapy is the number one way to prevent. I echo uh, Jerry's thoughts on adapalene uh, in, in the context of uh, treating acne, but also reducing scars. As dermatologists, we know, you know, when, when we prescribe isotretinoin, when we manage acne early, aggressively, reduce inflammation, we can often mitigate scarring. Um, th there's a good paper, uh, the JAMA paper, 2017, uh, in regards to isotretinoin and the timing of um, uh, procedures. So prior to this, um, circa 2010, 2013, I did that small study, only about 20 patients or so, investigating early remodeling of acne scars, because like Jerry said, if we get them early, if we treat acne early, we can reduce atrophic scars or even hypertrophic scars. So effective control of acne using medical therapy, and that's, in that study I did was with isotretinoin, very low dose, 0.2 to 0.3 milligram per kilogram, in a very non-invasive uh, RF, because this was prior to the JAMA papers, yeah? So I'm using a sublative, in this case, E-matrix, it's non-invasive microneedling. So we get this kind of results with, with, with it. We get a, a marked reduction in acne because of the isotretinoin, but we also get good scar remodeling far and above what we would see uh, for, for patients just on isotretinoin. So this, I guess, emphasizes the role of medical therapy in early remodeling. We can achieve quite a lot using non-invasive techniques. So how do I approach acne scars? Let's go to basic concepts. Pigment versus contour. And how I decide this is basically throw a light. So when I work in the theater, I work with angle lighting. That's where you can see shadows all the time. It's not bad photography. It's the way I actually try to uh, assess scarring. So macular erythema, you look at this and just go, well, it's, it's, it's flat, it's red. So throw angles of light and you can see the difference. So pigment can be brown, it can be red. Um, and the problem with pigment is that the pigment severity classification is not agreed on. There's no good classification. In fact, in Australia, I use goodman Barron scale. We have to, well, I wouldn't say have to, but this is the, it's expected of us from the, um, our Medicare medical insurance. Yeah, we're, we're grade one, mild scarring, and they've lumped it all as macular disease, pigment, red or brown. And in this case, you can see this different. On the right, you can see uh, grade one scar, yeah? macular uh, pigmentation, PIH. On the left, you can see various types of scars, grade one, grade three, grade four scarring. So pigment can also occur with uh, scars. And there are different types of pigment, including drug induced as well as post-inflammatory. So this is Prof Go's paper. PIH is very common, you know, and, and it's a significant um, uh, case of morbidity yeah and, and in the vast majority of cases you don't have to have severe acne mild to moderate acne and 25 percent persists for uh, you know nearly five years so it's important to actually prevent and treat so there are many ways i treat it including topicals lasers peels uh, topicals my go-to are the tyrosinase inhibitors um, i also use retinoids and uh, non-hq tyrosinase inhibitors and i think one that comes out quite frequently in the literature is uh, azalic acid because it treats both inflammation as a tyrosinase inhibitor as well. The lasers, if it's red, vascular, if it's brown, pigment. Um, good papers was the paper by Emil Tangetti, 1927 um, uh, diode lasers, so the clear and brilliant or the thulium driven 1927 fraxel in regards to PIH. Uh, various peels can be used. 
uh, in emerging therapies. So I, I have started using the uh, vascular endothelial growth factor one modulators plus mutagen uh, modulators as what we use for melasma. Um, and once again, fractional lasers we talked about. So once again, PIE is relatively easy to treat, yeah, because especially in type one, type two skin, uh, when we can use short pulse duration for vascular lasers and get these usually within, uh, you know, two at the most three treatments. PIH is a little bit harder, um, grade one, grade two scars. In this situation, you know, we, we use uh, nano lasers and tyrosinase inhibitors. Uh, and this shows what um, PIH can occur with, can occur with both grade three, grade four scars together with grade one. Um, the uh, grade three, grade four is harder to treat generally than the, uh, than the PIH. And this is a patient of mine just using uh, nano lasers, but also uh, T acid uh, as in the BGF1 modulators. So the summary, try to prevent it. Yeah, obviously use sunscreen, uh, avoid. Uh, I like using topicals and rotational uh, therapy and nano and pico for pigment. Now we come to contour. Uh, if it's raised, it's either hypertrophic or um, a keloid scarring. Uh, if it's depressed, it's atrophic. So atrophic versus hypertrophic. Hypertrophic can be within the scar boundary itself. Uh, and um, for keloid scarring, it's beyond the boundaries of the actual uh, degree of inflammation. So many ways to treat hypertrophic scars. I think this probably deserves an, a whole lecture by itself. Um, I won't go too much into it. Prof. Phil Becker, who's a uh, close friend of mine and my uh, mentor, a very smart gentleman, he's, he's um, gave a very good talk on scar management with hypertrophic scarring just about three nights ago. So I'll you can find that on YouTube, but I'll link it with my Instagram so you can watch that uh, webinar. So the concepts, uh, how do I approach it? A traffic scars. Most of us use a J Jacob classification. Um, that's the one we most commonly use, yeah? And we describe different types of scars. Ice pick, rolling, box scars. I'll go into that shortly. But how I like to deliver my, I guess, thoughts on scars is, where is the level of atrophy? Is it superficial or is it deep? Or most commonly it's mixed because it's very rare to get monomorphic scars. They're often, excuse me, polymorphic in nature. So it's good, it's useful to think histology. Where is the deficit? Is it high up? Is it low? Is it the combination? So understanding the level of atrophy, I think that's very important. This is dermal atrophy, yeah? And this more than likely is subdermal. This is atrophy in the fat because um, when you have acne, you have a eruption of the pilosebaceous uh, unit, yeah, which is um, situated in both the dermis bells and the sub -Q. So this more than likely is dermal and subdermal atrophy. So with ice pick scars, they're very common. Uh, the box scar scarring, uh, that's when the scar is wider than it is deeper. Uh, but once again, these are broad classifications and rolling scars where it's more rolling with ill-defined edges, often with tethering. But you know, the scar type is very, it's, it's not very accurate because they're poorly described scar types. And for example, fibrotic scars, stelate scars, a mixture of different types of scars. And even within the scar, you can have at the 10 to four o'clock margin, a well-defined box scar scar, or is it ill-defined from the four to 10 o'clock margin? That's within the same scar type. So this is a summary in atrophic scars. Like I said, it's good, it's useful to think histology. So we talked about pigment versus contour, and let's talk about the commonly practiced revision methods of which I use. So the first thing is surgical. Don't underestimate punch, uh, punch uh, excisions. Always test spot. This was a case of mine just yesterday, so um, punching uh, ice pick scars. Surgical modalities are very important, excision of linear scars, um, and can often combined with TCA cross if there's deeper scars. So what can excision do? In one treatment, it can give these kind of results, yeah, which, which I think is pretty good. But once again, the scar's got to be orientated within the area. A little bit more advanced surgical procedures, that's uh, what I call uh, full thickness fractional excision uh, for atrophic scars, can give good results. Subcision is what I use most, um, and I use everything from a 12 gauge to a 30 gauge uh, needle. Uh, and the basis behind it is actually breaking the bonds Contrary to what all the illustrations show, most of the, <laughs> the plane which you're in is actually uh, below the dermis, yeah? So it's in the sub-Q. I use many dis in, uh, different instruments. Uh, my favorite, uh, the 22 cannulas, but also the no cause. But once again, it depends on the actual scar type I'm treating. This is the original report by um, the Austin Church Brothers in 1995, uh, what I call the windscreen wiper method. 
uh, cannula methods have been described over the last couple of years. No core, once again, over the past decade or so. But it's very important once you actually uh, instrumentation with no core, you've got to be very careful with the nerves, yeah? And often you mess with that. So subcision, uh, you can have large calibre instruments, but I actually use subcision to dial in the artillery. So what I call dial in the artillery because I can figure out where uh, the scars are. Uh, that way the treatments are very different, which means when I dial in the actual energy device, more than likely it's going to be more accurate because the um, subcision, the cannula is telling me where the scars are. Um, so we'll start off with, a, let's see this video. This is tumescent and um, anesthetic. I'm putting a 15 blade here. And once again, it depends on the scar type. If I'm dealing with tethered scars, I'll use a bigger instrument. That's a no core. I'm subsizing underneath because there's no way a cannula will go through there, especially with fibrotic scars, yeah. Uh, and this is a large instrument, that's a 16 gauge fork. I also use 14 and 12 gauge instruments. So once again, it's got to be done very safely. So I tumesce the whole area. I use a, a formulation very similar to Klein's uh, formulation for uh, tumescent liposuction. <laughs> but basically, this is keyhole surgery for, uh, for face, yeah, for, for the acne scarring. So you can see that's a 21 gauge in comparison. It's actually a large bore instrument. So be careful uh, because there's your parotids and uh, lots of nerves uh, in that area. This is no core, uh, temple area, but once again, I've really too messed that area for, for added safety. Peels, um, my, my standard peels are the TCA and uh, phenol croton oil peels. Uh, they're great for ice pick scars, but they can actually be used for box scar scarring as well. Uh, 2002 was the first reported by um, the Koreans. I modified it in 2007, and it's taken me literally 12 years to find a more efficient method, which I call TCA paint, uh, because the paint can actually be more direct. It's, it's much faster. It's much more accurate. Uh, and you can do things like this. You can treat scars uh, you know, impartial. For example, the, the box scar scar uh, from the 10 to 4, but leave the saucer scar below uh, untreated. And that, that's the beauty of using a paintbrush. Uh, and th these are the results that you can achieve uh, with time and effort. Um, so with chemical peels, uh, the various, uh, I guess, things in the literature, various reports in the literature, I'm actually uh, favoring TCA over phenol. Uh, I've got very little in the way of side effects. Uh, in, in last 20 patients I've done with phenol, the results haven't been that good compared to TCA. So these are the expected results for TCA, which is very predictable. So you don't have to have lasers for this. Uh, certainly lasers can help. We can treat broad box scar scars as well. This is the expected outcome. So patients often get the shock and horror with that. So you've got to show them pictures and warn them this is what the, is normal. It can also be treated uh, for dark skin type. Yeah, And you've got to warn about PIH, but I haven't had any bad side effects from TCA. This is probably about 70% and I go up to 90 and 100 as a standard. So a blade of lasers, uh, my favorites are CO2 as well as an erbium. Uh, and most of the time I'm using uh, erbium fully ablated. Sometimes I'm using CO2 uh, fully ablated. So this is the aftermath of a CO2. Uh, and for type one, type two skin, shallow scarring, uh, results are very predictable, yeah. Um, it, it's a relatively, Easy process, it doesn't take long at all if you've got a good system, type one, type two skin, very easy. Uh, and, and within one treatment, you can reduce or remove the vast majority of scars. Once again, if they're superficial, if you have subcutaneous atrophy, if you have rolling scars, it's gonna be very different, obviously. So I'm gonna show you a little bit more challenging cases. These are Asian patients, skin type three. You are gonna get some PIH. You've got to warn the patients uh, with that. Uh, but you can get the majority of scars in one treatment. Uh, and these are all Asian patients. So PIH is almost universal. But like Prof Go told me, yeah, it, it's basically a trade. You tell the patient, look, I'm gonna, you're going to trade your scars for PIH. PIH will last anywhere between uh, two to four months. Um, how do you feel about that? Most patients are willing to. So that's a blade of lasers. Fractional lasers, um, I particularly prefer CO2 fractional lasers compared to, compared to the rest. I also use erbium. Uh, the results are great. Um, once again, if you have superficial scars, very predictable results. Um, steelite scarring there, even in darker skin type, Middle Eastern gentlemen after four treatments, um, CO2. Fractional non-ablative. This is where I guess my thoughts may differ from others. Uh, I've used a lot. I've got uh, 1927, 1440, 1450, 
1540 as well, yeah? And I have not been able to replicate these company photos from Salter. Um, it's just I've, I've had dismal results using uh, non-ablative. I do believe that low density ablative lasers give better results compared to non-ablative lasers and newer generation RFM, that's radiant frequency devices, give equal or superior results compared to non-ablative lasers with less downtime. That's my view. Pico lasers. I mean, the early adopter, uh, Pico Schreiber started about uh, nearly six years ago. Uh, many other lasers reported, many other case reports and many other big studies in the last two, three years. Um, I just don't have the talent to uh, replicate these studies. I, I've done PICO in, in the early years, uh, off-label treatments as well, big treatments, lots of shots. I cannot get the um, results which I see uh, in, in the papers, possibly because um, I'm treating uh, type one, type two skin as well, together with type three, type four. And we know with the PICO, if you have chromophore rich uh, with Emil Tengeti's uh, histology, you can get some LIOBs or laser induced optical breakdowns, which uh, increase cytokines. So it, it is more of a, um, possibly it could be due to the um, uh, selection of patients. Yeah. So I'm still fence sitting on PICOs. Uh, microneedling, lots of ways to deliver microneedling, um, whether it be non energy based uh, or uh, energy based. I prefer microneedling non energy based for treating hypographic scars uh, together with intralesional uh, cortical steroids. RF microneedling, it's called radio frequency microneedling or RFM, various different devices. Uh, I prefer insulated, yeah. Um, so I've done some histology published in uh, Derm Surge last year in regards to radio frequency microneedling. Um, once again, these photos, I've only got a selection of photos which are not mine. This is from uh, Steve Weiner. Steve is actually a very good friend of mine, plastic surgeon in the US. And he's done lots of research in regards to RFM and got um, FDA approvals through. The reason why I haven't got many photos of that is because most of my treatments are um, multimodality rather than uh, unimodality. Um, I, I do believe RFM is the most cost effective or the most effective fire and forget system. We can upskill uh, therapists very quickly. It le needs the least amount of training. Uh, there's less side effects compared to lasers. And I do believe they're more effective than NA lasers. Uh, so this is a short clip and just a flying clip on the energy devices which I use. This is insulated microneedling, protects the epidermis. Uh, I've used uh, I've used quite a fair few. Yeah? I've used about four or five uh, devices. This is the Genius Polytronic. Uh, the previous is the Infini. Uh, and it treats deep superficial uh, scars. Also help, uh, it can be treated with that. This is the Infini. Um, CO2 resurfacing, fractional. I prefer the... Um, uh, Luminous, uh, the core also used because it's got a really nice spot size. Um, and this is fully ablative laser resurfacing. So once again, if I can get under the scars, uh, this is when I use fully ablative. So I use it all the way up to skin type three, four. Uh, this is skin type three, Asian patient. So you can see that's fully ablative laser resurfacing. Uh, if I can get below the scars, I know I've got them. Uh, so I always pick and choose. The, um, the patient which I elect to perform this procedure on. Fraxel 1550, once again, in my experience, the, it, it, it's, it's dismal. Maybe I'm seeing a different uh, uh, subgroup of patients. Uh, this is the RF I was talking about. We'll call it subablative, where it doesn't actually uh, ablate skin. U laser, I think it's a very good laser. It's a, a hybrid laser with uh, 1540 non-ablative together with the CO2. That's probably the way of the future for lasers, yeah? Um, I think it's a very good system. Okay, so dermal fillers and atrophic scars. I'm going quickly with this, I know time's the limit. What is the level of atrophy? So we, when we want to treat atrophy, we want to, uh, number one, stimulate fibroblasts, uh, or number two, uh, replace uh, fat. <laughs> so if you have too much atrophy, it's too hard. Um, and big volumes, generally speaking, uh, body's immune system can't generate, especially if it's fat and adipose tissue, yeah? Um, so the way I convey to patients is that we want plastic surgeons and derms who want to stimulate their fibroblasts to produce collagen and adipocytes to regenerate fat. We ask this of your immune system, but sometimes um, it's just too much of an ask. So dermal fillers, I use everything from HA fillers, collagen stimulating. Um, my uh, success rate for fat transfer in the context of scarring is, is pretty dismal. Um, <laughs> So this is great. Dermal fillers are great for, for treating uh, huge amounts of, of atrophy. Yeah. Um, 
And sometimes a case like this, where, where we've got cutaneous uh, SLE discoid uh, lupus erythematosus uh, in the scalp, there's no way I want to risk criminalization of, of her uh, of the skin. And this is where I think dermal fillers come in handy. That's all the steroid induced atrophy in scars. So I always subsides before injecting it as Prof told me once a long time ago saying, you know, if you don't subsize, you're going to get donuts, which is, you know, fillers go to an area of least resistance. So it's a very useful modality for treating atrophy. Now the basic filling techniques I use, so this is, you can see if the calcium hydroxy appetite, putting the filler high up, I always subsize before I inject. Um, this, I think this is a, this is a good way to, 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 uh, to, to instill filler. This is hyaluronic acid. Um, you've got to be very careful of not subsizing too much with your retaining ligaments. There's a mandibular retaining ligament here. Um, this is Greg Goodman's uh, technique, uh, inverted tower technique. It's very good to save product. It's not a good treatment for safety. Uh, this is me filling in the dermal subcutaneous. You can see the flicker because I'm uh, filling in shadows. Uh, and this is uh, really the brown pants moment where, you, where you're doing filler in the forehead that you, if you cannot see the tip of your needle, do not inject. And then the bevel is always up. So if a donut happens, you stop uh, and it's a very, you can see it's very, very superficial. So with extreme caution in the forehead, but it can give good results. So it's not always plain sailing, especially when you're flying because uh, side effects occur. And anyone doing acne scar revision, anyone doing procedural, need to actually understand the risk benefit ratio of things. So surgical, this is a hematoma, expected with your PIH uh, in type three skin, unexpected with your PIH in type one, type two skin. Expected with your hypopigmentation, unexpected hypopigmentation lasting more than 12 months. So once again, PIH. Erythema like this is common, especially if you're chasing scars, but you've got to see what the parameters were in Look, th this patient was happy. I've given her more than likely permanent hypopigmentation, uh, but then uh, she's very happy because the scar's gone. Laser, when we're treating scars like this, we know that there is a lack of pilosebaceous units. We've got to be very careful, even though I was very careful, 2% density, two passes, this is what I got. Hypertrophic scars, it took me 12 months to subside this. Uh, once again, scarring along the jawline. I've used very sensible parameters with this, 2%, yeah? Infection, this was just last week, um, staph. Uh, gridding from lasers from another dermatologist. Radio frequency microneedling, gridding from my nurse. <laughs> uh, DIY peels, um, peels from another dermatologist who's, who accidentally spilled TCA, it took me two years to repair this. Uh, and this is my only side effect from TCA, hypopigmentation, HYPO, persistent for more than 12 months. Uh, I think I've done more than 5,000 cases over the last 13 years. This is the only side effect. Fillers, and this is very important. Um, atrophic scars, uh, thought I was good doing this. Uh, had an incident, asked the patient, uh, look, you know, I think I may have hit something uh, as in your blood vessel. Can you please give me a picture in a couple of hours? Gave me that. Uh, came in the next day and I highlighted the whole lot. So you've got to actually understand with fillers, the scars do not respect anatomy. They occur where you don't want them, to, where you don't want to inject. You also lose the fat. You also lose the buffer zone. So your zone is diminished. We know uh, when we go in, especially surgical scars, it alters histology. They bleed a lot. They can pick up a, a vessel. Scar-directed techniques may increase the chance of arterial compromise. Um, so, you know, if you're doing 10 injections per side for a patient and doing the vertical tower technique, you're injecting 20 injections per patient. If you do five patients per day, you do about 500 blind injection points per week. How long before you get another occlusion? For me, I wasn't gonna hang around for another occlusion, so I changed my techniques. You got to understand anatomy for safer filling. You're not gonna get safe filling altogether, but safer. Technique is important, cannula and visualization with uh, ultrasound. I think that's up and coming. So please people, um, smart people learn from mistakes from others, learn from mine, yeah? Because um, <laughs> try not to make them. Prof, have we got any more time? Um, I'll go through a few cases, yeah? Um, so this, these are just a few of my closing yes, cases. For, yeah, for, for, for this week. Um, I'm not gonna show you my best cases, I'm just gonna show you what I've done this week. Uh, a doctor from, uh, for, from Melbourne, uh, multi-level subcision, radio frequency. So you can see from March till June, uh, these are selfie pictures and just 
in the last uh, session, what did I do? I used TCA for the shallow scars. Uh, I used subcision for the shallower, for, for the deeper scars, right? And then I used uh, erbium fractional. Uh, why of IRFM? Uh, because in this situation, I know my erbium is probably gives a better response compared to radio frequency because the scars are now superficial. So erbium fractional, less PIH compared to CO2, uh, less downtime. Uh, this is a Tongan. So I'm going to show you all the, the type, type 3 and above skin, yeah, just to be fair, because type 1, type 2 is a little bit easier to treat. So this is a nurse. I just did, I think, yesterday, two sessions. Uh, she had, she's a very fast responder, TCA paint, RFM, low density CO2, uh, very limited subcision. You can see the PIH on the right cheek. Uh, the CO2 I used was the mixed two. I know a lot of Singaporeans like using that. It's a very good laser. Uh, and just yesterday, I just did the uh, fractional um, erbium laser. Uh, so hopefully that'll be her last treatment. So I'm more than likely managed to smash the scars out in three treatments. Uh, Filipino skin type three, this is my Pico, yeah? Um, so she had a Pico by another dermatologist. After three sessions, 2016, minimal improvement. This was just uh, yesterday. So I treated her with um, fully ablative. Once again, if I'm under the scars, if she can handle the PIH for two, three months, or even slightly longer, um, scars will be treated in one session. Yeah, so it's very important to inform your patients and, and treat them accordingly. Japanese lady, uh, this is deep scarring, both uh, dermal plus uh, more than likely uh, subcutaneous. So I managed to get you know good improvement over time. Uh, she's got downtime, so I used erbium, uh, and I think she's going to get a good improvement with that. Uh, this is a fast responder. Uh, this is a uh, no, sorry, this is a Chinese uh, Chinese girl. Um, and you can see very fast response, yeah? So just yesterday I did a fully ablative erbium laterally because the rate limiting scars are more medial. So there's no point giving her downtime. I'm using the TCA to uh, raise those up, but then the lateral aspect of the cheeks can be treated with fully ablative. A doctor I just treated today. So this is my last patient uh, before, <laughs> before uh, coming home. You can see from March to May, uh, he had uh, ultrapass by another dermatologist, minimal improvement because a lot of the scars were tethered. It was commenced on isotretinoin in October. Uh, and this is a slow responder. It took me three sessions of, of really aggressive subcision to go from October till June, till today. Um, and today I did more subcision and, and some erbium lasers. He's, he's, we don't get fast responders all the time. Yeah. So the last couple of slides, the rate limiting factors, biology and physiology. Uh, I think Jerry's slide on the modulation of inflammation is very important. We know we st I, I suspect that in some cases there's ongoing inflammation. So I'm not too sure about the role of doxycycline. I'm using it during the revision process to modulate inflammation. In some cases, I'm doing very dilute corticosteroid injections for cases that retether. Uh, the future lies in hybrid lasers, hybrid fillers as well. Ultrasound imaging by Steve Weiner. He's, he's doing a lot in regards to research with that and understand that um, the progress is a uh, law of diminishing gain. So we always have to adapt and that the patient's response lies in the bell curve. Um, there's no one single modality that's universally effective. The answer does not lie in the brand of laser or energy device. It lies in finding the correct treatments for the scar patterns presented to the physician. Uh, Prof, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's, it's a real honor to, uh, to, to talk even with, with, uh, with your, you on podium, yeah? Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for the very excellent lecture. Very informative, very useful. I'm sure the patients, I mean, the attendees are very pleased with the, uh, having learned from what you have shared with them. We have a lot of questions. There were more than 70 questions here. So I don't know how to start, but I'll just go down one by one and then uh, get you all to answer the question. Now, the one of the questions was from, uh, from one of the doctors in Pakistan. And he said that he has got a, a patient with severe acne and had treatment with oral uh, doxycycline, the usual benzoyl peroxide retinoids, and the patient responded very well. But then after a short while, they found that the, uh, the, the acne has come back even while on treatment. So he's suggesting that what should she do next for this particular patient? It seems to be a I common phenomenon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you can, if you can if has access to that. So maybe we ask uh, Jerry, um, about the management, because I remember that the uh, in in the, in in the Europe and all that, and even in America, before you start oral isotretinoin, you must have a several causes of oral antibiotics before you can start. Is that still the case now? Uh, you have to unmute. 
Unmute your mic, please. You're quite yes. right. I think the European authorities have um, indicated that in part of their uh, treatment algorithm. Um, that doesn't apply to Canada or the US. So the, the current routine in a patient like uh, the one presented by the participant is I would actually back up and look at all of the aspects of lifestyle first. Have we addressed um, the lifestyle issues? Have we addressed her medications? Is there anything that's in the way? Um, is she on a different exercise program? Is she taking um, supplements? Is she on whey protein? Uh, are there medications that we may have missed initially that might be triggering up her acne? And then we move on to just uh, recommending again the dairy avoidance and the uh, low glycemic index diet. And beyond that, then we can move on to medications as long as our pathway is clear. Because for the most part, what I try to encourage patients to try to understand is acne is probably more based on what we do than the fact that we are uh, absent pharmacologicals in our body. Okay, So the likelihood is that because of some of these uh, mod modulations from the exposome or external factors, that they are triggering the acne that we are developing. Um, of course, when we use medications and uh, treatments like oral isotretinoin, one of the teachings I think is helpful is that when you're nearing the end of isotretinoin, and you can always tell because you know that the patient comes in smiling more and more every time they come and see you. You know that you've turned the course and uh, it's beyond the halftime show now. So they're continuing to improve. And that's when you can start initiating topical retinoids. And the reason I do that is twofold, because that's probably going to be the maintenance therapy for acne. Plus, it prepares them in case we're going to do some scar repair procedures as well. Do you have a situation where my patient is very apprehensive about taking off the isotretinoin, especially when they're on low dose treatment and they have been so well and they're so happy and the seborrhea is hardly anything at all. And you tell them, I think you should stop it. And the patient will just tell them, no, I will refuse to stop. Well, but you know, it, it's an interesting issue. It's a lot like your, your psoriasis patients who are doing so fabulously and they're now at PASI 100. And you think, oh my gosh, you know, do you really need that frequency of dosing? So I, I think um, going back to Davin's thoughts about how our mental aspects are so critical to how we do and how we feel, um, I, I negotiate with patients. I won't tell them you need to stop. I will say, okay, let me make sure I understand why you want to continue. And then, you know, the only reason I'm thinking we may want to find an end date is because maybe you don't need it anymore. Plus a medication in your system when you don't need it is not going to give you more improvement. It's just going to put you at risk of side effects. So let's see if we can negotiate this um, impasse so that you can get as good as you want with the least risk. That's what they don't hear sometimes is the notion of risk. So okay. I think if we can articulate it that way, that, and sometimes for us, if it's young, a young man, maybe to him there's very little risk and to us as well. And then your risk benefit ratio might be, yeah, maybe you should continue a little longer. So it's yeah, always okay. gonna be negotiated separately. Yeah. All right, that's a good lesson. This question is for Devin. Can you comment on the efficacy of the plasma treatment, the neogen treatment for acne scars? I suppose, especially in particular to the Asian population. Yeah, no, I, I have very little experience with that, um, as in the actual plasma, as in um, uh, Aaron Bovey type plasma. I'm, I was interested in the, uh, in the device a few years ago. I never trialed it, so I, I have no experience with that. Prof, have you had any experience with that? Yeah, we had, actually, this is a second generation. There was a new, uh, an old system that came about. We tried it, and uh, they have very severe post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Mm -hmm. So we stopped doing, using it, and I think the machine went dead after that. And after about, I think, eight to 10 years later, it revived again, and they have reset it, recalibrated it, and it's supposed to be less aggressive but I've not yeah. tried that new machine yet. 
Now the other question is <laughs> <much> you try. <laughs> <laughs> the other question for you is is Rijuran. I'm not sure you heard of Rijuran, the salmon DNA comparable to other substitutes of uh, fillers when it comes to scar revision. Have you tried that? No, I haven't. I've tried. Um, I've tried other 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 um, stems. Yeah, I think uh, Singapore. I don't know whether you have the um, calcium in. Have you ever got calcium in Singapore? Yes, yes, yes. It's from Singapore yeah. guy actually, the plastic surgeon. Yeah, I yeah. I know. <laughs> so um, Stephen Liu and myself are doing some split face at the moment. Yeah, with uh, with everything from from uh, rejuve to, to scarring. Um, so far, I haven't had uh, brilliant results. Uh, but we've only done about eight patients. Yeah. With the stems. Um, another question is um, what about PRP in the treatment of acne scar? Devin? Yeah, that, that's a good one. I mean, the, the, there's very limited studies. There's one or two studies where it's uh, split face with, uh, with saline. Uh, and even then, uh, the results are equivocal. So I really wanted to believe in PRP um, many years ago, yeah? And I did quite a fair few patients. What I saw was an increase, uh, slightly increased recovery rate, but I did not see any uh, scar improvement uh, with PRP. And I did it both under and over as well. So for, for me, it's, a, it's based upon the literature and my experience. It's, uh, I think it's, it's, efficacy is not indicated in, in scarring. Yeah, it's not it's not available in Singapore in terms of its legality, uh, yes. but I don't think it is really that great from 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 some of the experience I've seen. Now this is for Jerry. I've seen only one article on the use of Montelukast in acne. What is your experience or the role of Montelukast in inflammatory acne? Do you use that, Jerry? I don't uh, personally use Montelukast. Um, the the I think the roles of some of the, um, in, including the antihistamines, are the fact that many of the antihistamines are not solely working through mast cell inhibition. Um, they have a fairly widespread anti-inflammatory profile, including, if you believe it, TNF-alpha inhibition. <clears throat> so when this loratadine, for example, was evaluated in that Korean study, it was done so with a, an open eye approach because they knew that they had a number of other uh, positive effects on reducing inflammation. Um, the role of other uh, medications like Montelukast, I haven't seen directly, but I have had really positive outcomes with some of these uh, second and third generation antihistamines like this loratadine, like um, uh, Less so claritin, but um, the, the I think the desloratadine seems to have more of these anti-inflammatory effects. The way I'm using them is not necessarily on, you know, wherever you would choose to use an antibiotic is where you could trial the uh, antihistamine. And because the risk profile is so positive, so little downside risk, <clears throat> patients are much more inclined to be a little bit more um, reflective on using them. Plus also in patients who have this um, periodic cyclical acne, that's another area to consider using it just periodically um, a week or so before their menstrual period starts. <clears throat> okay, what is the role of antioxidants in acne treatment? Is there any role at all? That's a really good question because, you know, a lot of the treatments we use actually induce oxidation. For example, benzoyl peroxide um, can, and azelaic acid induce a lot of oxygen-free radicals to do the work, which is to mop up and target um, C acnes. <clears throat> I think what happens with antioxidants is if these um, free radicals and uh, oxides are left to kind of run rampant, it may cause more damage beyond the uh, follicular structures and into the dermis, and that's exactly what you don't want. So my thinking is that if you're using vitamin C and um, retinoic acid, uh, products of that type, which are very positive in terms of improving um, antioxidant, with antioxidant effects, I think I don't see a problem with that because I think that helps to preserve the matrix. 
I, and that's all based on opinion. There's, there's, no, there's no true evidence on that within the context of ACME. <clears throat> okay, the next two questions are also for you, Jerry. One is, uh, if a patient has got psoriasis and acne on the face simultaneously, how would you treat the acne? Um, well, psoriasis and acne on the face, generally, I think the approach would be um, how much does each of them bother the patient? For example, with psoriasis, it can be extremely bothersome because it looks like they've been burnt uh, because there's patches of redness and flaking. So I start with that decision point, and then we focus on what it is that bothers them the most. Um, if we are mostly using topicals for their psoriasis, and depending on the, the severity of their acne, we could always use something less irritating for their acne, for example, topical Dapsone or um, a product like a very mild uh, retinoid um, and using it every second or every third night. Those are all options to try to tone down the potential for irritation. <clears throat> okay, another question for you is the, uh, your experience about treatment of severe acne in pregnancy. That's a really tough question because um, in pregnancy, there are, um, the, the treatments really would focus on the issues of uh, phototherapy, um, blue light, if you have that available. Um, quite frankly, although there is, um, there is some discussion about whether it's, um, it's the right thing to do in the absence of blue light, for example, in these days, I would probably encourage them to get natural sunlight um, because you know that's practical, readily available, and you don't have to go to a clinic and have a greater risk of COVID exposure. The other one is going to be uh, systemic antibiotics. I think we have to be a little cautious about that. Erythromycin, for example, can be considered. Um, I would stay away from the cyclins because of uh, tooth and bone issues. Um, but otherwise, we're really limited in those types of patients. The, the topical that's considered to be um, topical treatments that are more considered to have a lesser risk profile in pregnancy are treatments like benzoyl peroxide as well as azelaic acid. So I think those ones would be reasonable, including their combination products. Okay, and again, another problem of severe acne. And if you have a patient with severe acne and refuses to take oral isotretinoin, mm -hmm. what would you do to the, in your treatment? Well, you know, the isotretinoin, um, there are a couple of issues with isotretinoin. And one of them is really uh, the notion of how can we help make sure we understand their fears and you know, can we provide them with reassurance and information so that you don't have to treat them right now, but at least you're there to help them with it when they're eventually potentially ready to make that change over if they want. The other option, and we did this a few years ago, was actually to compare oral isotretinoin versus doxycycline and I think it was Epiduo, I think in, in the jurisdictions in Asia, it's called Epiduo. And we use that together in patients exactly like that, patients who had moderate to severe acne, who refused or had uh, intolerance to oral isotretinoin or were unable to access it. So that trial was done that way, it was an RCT. And what we showed <clears throat> was that of the two treatments, the one that worked more quickly was doxycycline and epiduo. So by the first two months, you actually saw greater improvement in that arm of patients than the isotretinoin arm. Now, it was then at the third to fourth month that we saw the isotretinoin group start to increasingly improve more. What that means to me from a practical perspective is we tell the patients, look, we can give you a chance to start this treatment, but unfortunately, by about third or fourth month, we're going to have to look at changing up your pill. Now, we know that if you continue the gel, if you can keep working with it and you have to have faith that it's gonna 
be there and do what you want, over a course of four to six months, we will be able to achieve that type of improvement that you just saw with the Oscar study, which is about 60 plus percent achieving clear, almost clear. So that's the way I would um, propose another option to them. And then what they can always do, you see what happens is you're buying time. And what you also wanna do is you wanna calm their acne as much as possible so they don't get more and more acne scars. And then during that period of two to three to four months, you have a chance to continue the conversation about isotretinoin. And you're not here as a salesman for isotretinoin. The reason you're doing that is you're a person who's trying to be on the side of helping that patient, not just now, but also in five years from now, 10 years from now, and so on, so that they can reduce that psychosocial impact and reduce the scars that are developing. Okay. And then... Uh... For David, the question is that uh, if you can achieve so good results with just a single ablative laser, why are we doing multiple fractional lasers? I think um, various reasons, yeah. Um, the, the scar type has got to be aligned with the actual procedure itself. So the, the scar types which I'm showing you for fully ablative are very, mainly monomorphic scars, yeah, box scar scarring, superficial scars. Because as soon as I get um, ice pick scars mixed in with that, the ablative laser would not touch the uh, ice pick scars. So I'm showing you uh, the before and afters for the patients who suit that uh, treatment. Okay. And how do you treat PIH after ablative laser for acne scar? Uh, usual with the uh, sun protection, you know, the, the sunscreens. I also treat with um, hydroquinone. Uh, and I use the subcellular selective photothermolysis settings, which, which the Kareem's use for melasma, yeah, the, the very low fluence Q switch, uh, somewhere around 1.3 to, to 2.0, 6 mil spot size, 1064. Um, Pico lasers can help. Um, and also I've been using transexamic acid as well. Um, so it's basically the, what we all use, yeah, for PIH. Okay. Uh, Jerry, is there limitations to the H? For the use of oral isotretinoin for the treatment of acne, is the, what's the lowest age that you can prescribe? Uh, there are no age limitations as I'm aware of, um, as long as you follow the appropriate precautions. Sometimes in infantile acne, those little ones can have very, very severe acne. Um, I personally haven't treated little ones with oral isotretinoin, but I've had conversations in the past with pediatric dermatologists who would not hesitate to use oral isotretinoin if needed um, in, in a very young age group. All right. Uh, Devin, is one substitution treatment enough to fully cut through all the bands that's holding down the acne scar? And is this separation permanent in other after you do the substitution? Uh, you won't have any residual tethering. I think it depends. Uh, if, if you have mild to moderate uh, rolling scars in someone who is, uh, in, in, especially in an area which is permissible for aggressive subcision, generally speaking, one will not get rid of everything, but one which should give you a, a marked improvement. That's if you actually find that there are bonds holding the actual scar down. So that's the first, that's the first um, thing. The other thing as well is that when we talk about retethering, there's no good studies that show um, the retethering. Um, there's, there's various studies that show, for example, uh, acupuncture to, um, to, to suctioning that may improve the outcomes. But when I go back to my patients, which I've done multi-level uh, subcision, extensive subcision, the last case I showed with the, uh, the young doctor, the, the young surgeon, I have no doubt that he retethers. That's why I want to start him on the low dose anti inflammatory. So I think that there are some cases that, that do actually retether. Just as long as we're taking steps forward, we're improving things though. And uh, do you do the substitutions and the uh, fractional lasers or whichever resurfacing that you do on the same day, or do you do it as a separate procedure? Uh, good, good question. Most of the time I do it on the same day because we're looking at um, the subcision is, is in the actual sub -Q, yeah, because that's a level of separation. So I'm in the either lower dermis uh, or mid sub -Q or even low sub -Q. 
whilst the uh, ablative lasers, generally speaking, we're in the uh, in the dermis, so so it's very very uh, different levels. So it depends if if the scars lend themselves towards a fractional treatment, I would do it on the same day. And you do the same for the uh, the peel, the your cross techniques and all that. You do them all together on the same day. Yes, um, the reason being is that, let's say if you get an ice pick scar and you put the TCA in, once you get uh, a whitening of it, frosting, yeah, the, the peel's done. It's a self-neutralizing peel, so you've already got coagulation. So once you laser on top of that, you're not going to that depth because you want the peel to go deeper and the laser to be more superficial. So you, you're working with different depths and the endpoints are very different as well. So the answer is yes. And this question says that there's... Fillers kills melasma. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't. Do you, do you have any experience feeling fillers clearing Kills melasma? melasma. No. Okay. And is there any risk of chemical peeling in dark skin type? I think your PIH chances are you will any 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 darker than skin type three you're gonna get PIH and I remember having breakfast with you one day, Prof, and you told me yeah. you know um, Davin you need to trade you got to tell the patient you're trading scars for PIH and that may last a couple right. of months it's a good yeah, trade right. so yeah, I, I think right. uh, it's universal you're gonna get PIH in skin type three or or, or greater the most feared yeah. is hypo and I've only had one case uh, to date. Okay, the next question is um, people on oral acetretinoin after discontinuation, do you have to give them a time lapse before you carry out your procedure to treat the acne yeah. scars? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I followed the, uh, the guidelines published in JAMA, yeah, the um, JAMA guidelines in 2017. I think that this uh, another guideline in Derm Surge, and the consensus is if you're doing, uh, apart from doing fully ablative procedures in deep, not focal, but deep. Uh, uh, field peels with the TCA or uh, phenol cretin. I don't do it in those two procedures, fully ablative and, uh, and deep peels. But all the rest, I'm uh, actually pretty comfortable based upon the guidelines. And uh, what about non-energy microneedling? I suppose these are the mechanical derma roller. Is it effective for ice pick scars and also roll, rolling scars? I mean, this, as you know, they can be effective. Generally speaking, if you generate uh, heat shock protein, you know, with with the uh, um, energy devices, usually you get a better uh, stimulation than remodeling of collagen. So the answer is that they can be effective, uh, but there are more effective treatments. So I still do use them, and but once again, I try to use them for delivery of uh, drugs into the dermis. Yeah. Okay, and. Um... There's a question on TCA cross technique. How many weeks between treatment uh, do you repeat the treatment? I mean, how do you do multiple sessions and how frequently do you do them? So I personally do them uh, four to six weeks. In the literature, there's a few good papers from, uh, uh, from India, Pakistan, and um, Middle East where they do it more frequently, once every two weeks. Uh, so I've accidentally ablated skin because the patient booked it too, too soon. You still get granulation tissue at two to, two to four weeks, yeah? So I try to leave it at four to six weeks before repeating. All right. How do you use chemical peels on patients, African patients who have type 5 or type 6 skin? Uh, I still do, I still do, but once again, it's 70% TCA, 100% chance they're going to have um, a PIH. Right. I think those are very difficult uh, uh, patients to treat because even if we do surgical techniques, for example, for, uh, you know, for ice pick scars, you're still more than likely going to get PIH with the, uh, with, with the surgery. So it's a challenging case, uh, but I pre warned the patients, yeah. Okay. Uh, Jerry, do you have any idea on the role of di dietary probiotics in <clears throat> the management of acne? I think that's... Uh... An evolving field. I know that there are some very early studies that suggest that there might be some positive outcomes, but they're they're very small. But I can't imagine that they don't have some positive outcomes. So I I think it's uh, it's one of these fields that in atopic dermatitis there has been more work done on the skin microbiome, um, and I think over time we'll probably also be seeing more work done on the skin microbiome in acne. 
plus also the gut microbiome in acne and rosacea. But it's very early days yet. <clears throat> we have a statement, a comment from a Dr. Liliana, who says that in our practice, we manage acne solely with lifestyle modification, topicals and treatment. We do not use antibiotics or isotretinoids at all. And we have excellent results. So we don't need antibiotics all the time. Okay, there another question is on about the use of Pico laser for acne scar. Which one is the best? I think Devin has already given an answer. He's not impressed by yeah, the Pico second laser. I was about to ask you, what's your, what's your view on this? Uh, because I, I've tried it, um, you know, even off label, uh, but I've only got one patient where I go, wow, th this is good. Uh, how, what, what is your opinion, Prof? Well, we, where the recommendation is to use a fractional handpiece to do the skin rejuvenation, including acne scar. And I think Eric Bernstein from um, the US showed very good results. And I have been repeating with, Pico, with our PicoSure lasers, with our uh, Enlightened lasers, and our, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Candela lasers as well. I never got any of those results at all. Oh, but, so it's not just me. It's not yeah, just me. I tell you, you know, the thing good about this is that a lot of these patients, although I tell them I don't see anything happening at all, but they say, <laughs> you know, improve my skin texture. You know? I don't well, know what yeah, they mean by the that. Pore sizing has decreased, definitely. Yeah, yeah that's right. Oh, so that's they're right. happy about that. You know? So <laughs> I think it doesn't change anything for acne scar, but uh, it has got some benefits to a certain extent. Uh, yeah, I think we have probably another one or two questions. Let me just scroll down. How significant is collagen stimulation? Uh, how, how significant is collagen stimulation occur after laser, uh, uh, filler treatment? Ah, Do you okay. get collagen stimulation? I guess, I mean, the, the paper showed that even with hyaluronic acid, you do get collagen stimulation, but I prefer in my really atrophic patients, I prefer the PLLA yeah, or, or even better the calcium hydroxy hyperdilute. So something like um, one to three or one to four dilution. I think you do get collagen stimulation from those fillers. Uh, and in the US, if you got your um, PMMAs. Uh, Jerry, do you have PM PMMAs in, uh, in Canada? Yes, we do, yeah. Yeah. So I think with those fillers, you, you probably do get uh, neocollagenesis with it. Okay. Do you believe in a cautery as a as for treatment of acne scar? Can you use a cautery, uh, no, cryotherapy, I think. Cryo cautery, cryotherapy. Is there any role of cryotherapy in the treatment of acne scar? Well, I mean, I, I trained in, in the UK and um, when we're talking about, it's funny because when in the UK we use cryotherapy to treat that big cyst, I think uh, Leighton and Cunliffe reported the, uh, the use of cryotherapy in, in where I worked in uh, Chester in, in the Wirral, we use cryo for cysts. In the context of what they're asking, I pre presume it's probably cryotherapy to get the intralesional steroid in uh, for hypertrophic and keloid scarring. So the answer is sometimes, but I think it's going to knock off your melanocytes if you do it too often. Yeah. So I, I probably think a good injection technique with your intralesional or your mm -hmm. uh, microneedling with your intralesional drip probably is a, is a better option. Uh, cryotherapy, certainly for keloid and hypertrophic scars, yeah, especially keloid scarring. Okay, good. Now, this is a final question because I think we're running out of time now. This is for Jerry. Jerry, is adapalene safe in lactating women? Can it be used? The, um, yeah, I think the issue with um, the retinoids, as you know, is really teratogenicity. So as far as um, adapalene and the other retinoids, um, these are components of our natural diet. So we get it from food and um, it's part of the vitamin A metabolite, although of course adapalene itself is synthetic. I don't see a problem in a lactating woman um, as long as now, you know, recently there are topo retinoids that have been shown to be efficacious on the torso. So the caveat is that if you're going to be using it on truncal acne is to avoid the um, areola and the nipple if you're breastfeeding. But I don't see a, a problem otherwise. So you think, uh, is retinoid safe, topical retinoids, I mean, in pregnancy itself? 
or in people uh, who are going to get pregnant? Right. So the question then would reflect on teratogenicity. Yes. And in that situation, I think we would have to be a bit more circumspect and say that you know, there are potential risks with high doses of vitamin A. Tretinoin is a form of vitamin A, and it would be prudent for us not to use it if you're going to be pregnant or getting pregnant. Um, the caveat to that, by the way, is that if you measure baseline levels of retinoic acid in the bloodstream, um, the amount you get when you actually put on tretinoin on your skin, on your facial skin, actually doesn't make a difference. It doesn't change that intrinsic level. Nevertheless, because we have liability risk, okay, and, and you can never predict a pregnancy will be perfect and you will always be faulted for doing something rather than doing nothing, then I think that becomes the issue. Plus, the other way to look at it is, but doctor, what other options could you have provided that would not be um, increasing the risk to that pregnant woman, then the response would be, oh yeah, well, we could have used light therapy, we could have used blue light, we could have used benzoyl peroxide, we could have used azelaic acid. And yet you chose topical retinoids, which have this uncertain risk and in high enough doses truly have a risk. Can you justify that? So that's the way I would see that play out. And mm. my thinking then is if it's a woman at risk of pregnancy or she wants to get pregnant, maybe better after that type of explanation if she says look i still want to use it at least get her to sign a disclaimer that she understands that there's a risk yeah mm -hmm. okay good i think we've come to the end of the excellent and very informative session it remains for me to think to thank jerry uh, who has to wake up very early at 5 a.m to join <laughs> us I'm sorry about that no and problem. Devin, whose sleeping time for him is probably about <laughs> 10 o'clock in brisbane now it's time to sleep and then, of course, the, uh, the organizer, Index Singapore, for sponsoring this event.